welcome to Discovering Orthodox Christianity. I'm Stacey Spanos, your host for this series of programs designed to explain the basic teachings of Orthodox Christianity. We're honored to be filming at the beautiful Holy Cross Chapel on the campus of Hellenic College, Holy Cross Greek Orthodox School of Theology in Boston. So in today's program, we'll discuss music in the Orthodox Church. Joining us today is Archdeacon to Archbishop Dimitrios of America, Padelemon Papadopoulos. He is the director of the Archdiocesan School of Byzantine Music and the managing director of the Archdiocesan Byzantine Choir. Also, Dr. Vicki Pappas. For 30 years, she was the national chairman of the National Forum of Greek Orthodox Church Musicians, the musical arm of the Greek Orthodox Archdiocese of America, responsible for strengthening and perpetuating its liturgical music. And Dr. Gramenos Karanos, Assistant Professor of Byzantine Music at Hellenic College, Holy Cross Greek Orthodox School of Theology. Thank you, all three of you, for being here today. Thank you. Thank you. Nice to Good be morning. Here. Before we delve into the meaning of the music in the church, I would love it if you could offer us an example of the beautiful things people will hear when they enter an Orthodox church. Since, uh, Stacy, first of all, thank you. It's wonderful being in the company of such distinguished people next to me. And I think since we're in the chapel of the Holy Cross here on campus, where I spent many of my years studying, if the others agree, it would be nice to begin with the dismissal hymn of Holy Cross. Dr. Karanos. and it is so different from contemporary music. How did our church music come to be, Dr. Karanos? The church has always been musical. We constantly sing in the church. Why do we sing? Uh, a few weeks ago, uh, the president of our school, Father Nicolas Triantafilo, was giving a sermon here in this chapel and asked this very question, why don't we just say the words? Why do we have to sing everything? And he gave a very beautiful answer. Because all creation sings. The birds sing. All the animals sing. Every, everything that breathes praises the Lord. The angels in heaven sing. Uh, we know from uh, the Old Testament of the vision of the prophet Isaiah, uh, who saw this, the six-winged seraphim praising God and singing antiphonally, holy, 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 uh, is the Lord of hosts. In the New Testament, we see that the apostles and the Lord himself sang. As a matter of fact, the, the last thing they did after the uh, institution of the sacrament of Holy Eucharist, a uh, short time before the Passion, was to sing. It says in um, uh, St. Matthew's Gospel, nisandes exilthon istoros ton eleon. Which means? And after having sung a hymn, they went out into the Mount of Olives. It's the last thing they did before, it's the last thing that Christ did before going to the Mount of Olives to prepare for the Passion. Uh, the Bible tells us to sing. Saint James, the brother of the Lord, in his Catholic epistle, exhorts the faithful to sing when they are merry. Kakopathitis enimin prosefhesto, ephthimitis psaleto. Is anyone among you afflicted? Let him pray. Is anyone merry? Let him sing, let him chant. And we do chant because we are merry. We are merry, we are happy because of the resurrection of the Lord. And finally, we sing because it is easier to instill the truths of the faith in the hearts of the faithful when we do it with music. Uh, Saint Basil of Caesarea, the great Cappadocian father of the fourth century, draws an analogy between medicine given to the ill 
in the doctrines of the faith. And he says that uh, just like physicians mix honey into the more bitter medicine so that it's easier for, for the patients to swallow, so the church mixes melody into the hymns, into the truths of the faith, because some of them are hard to accept. I want to go back to something you said. You brought up singing and you brought up chanting. Father, why do we do both in the church? It's a very good question. If I may go back to what something that Dr. Menos made reference to, uh, which is for me very interesting, uh, Doctor, is the fact that in what you described by Isaiah, I mean, there's something to know, like God is so unknown. So we have this image of God surrounded by angels. And for me, I think what's very revealing is what is the activity that goes on next to the throne of God, so to speak? And they're singing. That's what they do. And that's they very, sing. I mean, I think that just it dawned on me now as I'm sitting here, <laughs> shamefully, after so many years of seminary, but it really dawned on me that the activity that occurs there is singing, is the praising of God. And going to then the uh, Last Supper, or this uh, before his last kind of moment with his disciples, you know, the idea that, yes, I'm going to the Passion, yes, there is a sense of joy, dare I say, to that, and so they offer up praises in whatever they sung. I don't know if there's a reference of that, Professor, in the actual Gospel no, text as no. to what they sung, but nonetheless they were singing. So I think that's very insightful. Probably something from the Psalms of David. Probably, right. probably. And, and I always think of um, um, when you talk about the angels surrounding the throne of God, that what really is happening when you enter an Orthodox church, the idea is that you're entering the kingdom of heaven. And mm -hmm. even in one of our hymns, the Cherubic Hymn, that we sing every Sunday during the Divine Liturgy, the, the exhortation is to leave your earthly cares behind mm -hmm. and come into the church and enter the kingdom of heaven. And that's why we have everything here so beautiful, our music that's beautiful, the icons, the gold, the priest vestments, the colors, all the beauty of the church is to remind us of this sense of being in heaven on earth and with the angels and the saints all surrounding us. So it's very, very meaningful um, what happens in our services and what we're trying to do. If I can go back to the difference between the choir and the chanting, why do we do both, Doctor? Originally we had congregational singing. Um, and sometime in the fourth century, the church decided to institute officially, to establish uh, the office of psaltis or cantor uh, for musical reasons, but also for reasons of doctrinal purity. Um, it seems that there was a tendency of uh, some of the faithful to uh, get up and spontaneously sing, spontaneously compose the words and the music. This might be musically uh, <clears throat> problematic, but it also might uh, be uh, doctrinally problematic because if you're not singing from an accepted book of the church, you might mix heresy into what you're actually proclaiming. Uh, therefore, in 363, 364, uh, the Council of Laodicea, with its 15th canon, uh, mandated that no one save the canonical cantors who have received a blessing from the bishop and sing from uh, accepted canonical books. No one else is supposed to be singing in the church. Of course, choral singing remained the norm. Uh, we know that uh, from uh, the manuscript tradition, and we know it from even uh, an edict by Justinian the Great in the sixth century uh, that mandates that no more than 25 people will be the members of the choir of Hagia Sophia, the great church of Christ. Uh, so we, had, we have congregational singing, we have choral singing, and we have solo singing for the more elaborate parts of the hymn. And Vicki, let me ask you, what do we say when we sing, especially for those who may not understand Greek? And there, there are, of course, American songs that we use as well. Well, the, the beauty of what's happening in the service is um, that over 90% of it is sung or cantillated. And as Menos was saying, there are different roles. The priests have certain prayers that they're saying, and the cantors and the choir members and the are, deacons. and the deacons are, um, <laughs> yes, are um, also singing prayers. So um, I think that's the most important thing to remember, that 
the music is conveying prayers. And as Menya said, they're the accepted prayers of the church. It's not just any text. So no matter who's doing what in the service, um, we're all praying from standard accepted text. And I like to think of it in that um, the hymns are of at least three kinds. And one, for instance, and we can demonstrate a little bit, um, one type of hymn, a lot of hymns are like this, where we're praising God. Um, and one, again, that we hear every Sunday is Agios Theos, Holy God, and we'll sing Which that a little bit. Which actually goes back to the uh, uh, vision of Isaiah. Of the, the, the right, right. Trisagio Simno, the thrice holy hymn. one type of hymn, praising God. Another type is a supplicatory hymn where we're asking um, the Lord to have mercy on us. We say, Kyrie eleison, Lord have mercy, all the time during our services. And a, a hymn that the, is like that. The shortest where, and most important Christian prayer. That's right. right. Kyrie eleison. That's Kyrie right. Eleison. And simple. Um, another time, at another time, again during the liturgy, we ask the Theotokos to intercede for us to seek um, the saving of, of the Lord. And that hymn is Tespitas Vias, or Through the Intercessions of the Mother of God. Same base? Mm -hmm. of hymns that um, tell us stories of the saints' lives. Um, every church has a church hymn um, telling the story of the historical background or the saint of that church. And also these kinds of hymns remind us of specific events in the church. And of course, the greatest event um, is um, Pascha. And so we sing a hymn like, like Christos Anesti, Christ is Risen. On
Thank you. I feel so lucky to have a front row seat to the beautiful music. Yeah. Always good to sing. Father, obviously, Christos Anesti is sung during a specific moment of our liturgical year. Yeah. How do chanters, how do choirs know what they're going to be singing from Sunday to Sunday? It's a very good question. We have books in the church. Um, every year is published from our ecumenical patriarchate, uh, what we call the Great Tipicom or the Tipicon, or the Merologium Ecclesiastes, the calendar of the church feasts, which there is designated very clearly for each Sunday or each weekday even, uh, exactly what hymns are, of course, immovable. So we have Desperus Vias in every liturgy. We have Save Us, O Son of God. We have a Cherubic Hymn, although that alternates on specific uh, feasts during the church. But we also have many movable hymns, especially uh, before the Divine Liturgy in the Matins, or the night before in the Vespers. And this book is the, the, the guiding light, so to speak, which indicates to the cantors or the choirs, well, these are the specific new elements for this particular service. And of course, not to get into it here, but there are different books uh, that have certain hymns contained in them. So resurrectional hymns are in these books. These are what we call Minea, which are the, the monthly kind of service books with all the saints of the month, with all the specific hymns for them and different kind of books like that. So for also clergy and for the cantors and for the choirs, we have um, these specific books. Additionally, and I think um, this is important because uh, we have to keep improving and making steps and perhaps that was also one of the reasons why the Archdiocesan School of Byzantine Music was founded, but you know, through the work of the, the forum as well, they also produced a liturgical guide. So we may have this book, you know, it comes to us. Well, uh, you know, our people, they need as much help as they could get. And so the forum will, you know, piece, even break it down further and give it, so to speak, so that they can just uh, have all the guidelines, you know, in English as well, with references to right. the variances in the services and whatnot. And well, the, well, the chanters, um know about all of these books right. and we'll have to work to put together a service um, using all the books that are right. taken from right. Liam and talked it's a, it's about. It's a science in and of itself. Knowing how to go through the books. Right. And, and to spin the, the analogy to, spin the right. to right. get to the book that's you right. need oh, that's right. yes. and, and for choir directors, because we're working from um, set compositions, um, with substitutions, um, as Archdeacon Pandaliamon was saying, we have the liturgical guidebook, yeah. which outlines for them what the changes are to the for regular year, hymns, right? yeah. and for that, that day, yeah. Um, yeah. And then the director can either turn to the the correct hymn in a particular um, service book of music, or may have to go and find another hymn from elsewhere, especially if it's a Saints' Day hymn. Um, or there's also a tradition among choir directors who are musically trained that they'll even write out a hymn for their choir members, which was really the old tradition of the chanters who, if they, if they didn't have the music, they would actually hand write it before the service and then pass it out to the choir. We still do it. Choir. Still do it, yeah. Even yeah. during a service. <laughs> <laughs> Doctor, let me ask you, you walk into some uh, modern day uh, churches of different Christian denominations and they'll have on stage a drum set, they'll have electric guitars, they'll have a singer. Uh, do you see the Orthodox Church headed that way anytime soon? And what, what do we think when we see that? Nobody really knows the direction that uh, church music will move into. Uh, after all, there have been uh, developments and growth in the music since the beginning of the Christian church. Uh, new styles have emerged. Uh, in the 14th century, for example, the Caliphonic style uh, was developed in and around Constantinople with the work of major composers such as uh, the great saint, the great musical saint, Ioannis Papadopoulos Kukuzelis. Is caliphonic style what we currently use? It's, let's say, uh, so, some of our uh, hymns are based on the caliphonic style. And there were developments, there were uh, influences from the secular music of the time, there were influences from neighboring nations. So we, and one thing I, I, I tell my students usually is, 
we, we cannot control music. Uh, there are some boundaries. Uh, and the, the main boundary is, the main rule is that music should be secondary to the world. If it is conducive to the salvation of the faithful, then the church will accept it. If it is not, then it will not. As things stand right now, and uh, according to our own aesthetic norms, um, drums and um, uh, different uh, musical instruments of, of that nature are not seen as conducive to the salvation of the, or to a prayer for life. Do we have any original hymns that we know there's been a continuous line of use from the earliest church? Osilaron. Osilaron, Agias Doxi, So Glad Some Light, mm -hmm. or, or Joyful Light, which is the lamp lighting hymn chanted in Vespers. Uh, it, it probably goes back to the third century AD. You, go ahead, Vicki. Well, I think another criterion that we have to think about as church musicians is just as the text has to predominate, that really drives what the music has to be like. The other thing that drives what the music is, is what's happening with the clergy and in the liturgy, because um, the musicians, the chant cantors and the choir people are in constant dialogue with the priest. And if a priest is, um, saying a, a prayer, a very solemn, prayerful prayer, you certainly can't have happy, joyful music. It, it has to blend. And so the music has to fit the liturgical setting. And so that puts another boundary upon what we do. And, and, and I think while there are developments, and, and I think of two developments um, that are happening right now is, um, or not right now, but at least since the 1940s on, um, the development of having, I think we're fortunate in our country of having very talented, um, trained um, musicians who compose on one hand. And so those people had the freedom to do what back in 1950 was shocking, to have very much more elaborate um, settings for choirs to sing. Um, and that tradition, although maybe nowadays it's not quite as elaborate, but the tradition of our trained composers writing music for choirs has moved things along. Does that have to uh, be approved by someone at some point? Not really, other than I think what Menos um, alluded to, that it becomes accepted or not accepted after a while based on does it serve the text and does it fit what's going on in the service. The other very interesting thing that I think is happening now is that we also have a lot of American-born trained cantors who have studied, and some of them, um, they're bringing that, that repertoire up into the church, and some of the choirs now are beginning to sing some of these ancient um, melodies as well. But more important, they're going back to the pre-publication of chant where it wasn't printed and discovering older hymns and bringing them back into our current um, repertoire. Let me so just those clarify, are very exciting. How, can they, how can they find them if it was pre-publication? They go to monastery, they're handwritten, they're, they were all handwritten. There are about how many? more than 7,500 manuscripts, yeah. uh, medieval and post-medieval ones. Uh, Beautiful. The repertoire in them has been transcribed into the new method of analytical notation, which is the official new uh, notational system that is in use by cantors nowadays. Uh, about 75% of that repertoire has been uh, transcribed, but not a lot of it has been published. Let me ask you, Father, how did the faithful fit into the musical service that the Orthodox Church offers? Well, for, for first and foremost, uh, the, the people are not integral. You can't have services, so to speak, uh, without people. You know, liturgy has to be attended by the faithful gathering, of, uh, the gathering of all the faithful. Uh, around uh, ultimately Christ in the Eucharist, around their priests, around their clergy. And uh, it's by the grace and power of the Holy Spirit that this, these individuals, though they be individuals, are brought into the oneness, the oneness, the one body of Christ. And, they, and in their worship and in their liturgical life, this mystery, so to speak, is, uh, is realized. Are we encouraged to sing? As well? I think I think what the, both the Dr. Pappas and Dr. Menos made reference to the fact that it was a congregational sitting, that there's no passivity in worship. You know, a lot of times, uh, the truth be told, uh, and forgive me, dear colleagues, but 
sometimes there's bad music and so people kind of tune out, you know, or there's a bad priest or a bad deacon for that matter that's not on pitch or whatever. And there's a, there's a disharmony which immediately spills over to the ability of the faithful to focus and to be prayerful and to be, you know, totally taken into the mystery, so to speak. But when it's They're being pushed out. But you know. when it's right, it is so right. right. Yes. Yeah. And music is a very, very powerful tool. And we've seen in other churches where uh, people are overcome by the Holy Spirit and there's a lot of hallelujahing. Right. If somebody felt that that's where they were going, would that be appropriate to do in a church service? I told you that I, I heard one uh, piece of music that brought tears to my eyes. It was yeah. so moving. Yeah. I think I read something once in St. John Chrysostom that the gift of the speaking in tongues was replaced by the deacon in the sense that what the tongues of the faithful who are in the pews their petitions their prayer to god is sort of is funneled through the mouth of the deacon in peace let us pray to the lord for the peace of the whole world for our archbishop for their temperate seasons for for this for that and then the deacon carries those prayers to the holy altar to the throne of god right and then he goes in and then he comes and appears again at the royal doors pronouncing let us pray to the lord you know and then turns back comes back so there's this constant flow of you know what the people are bringing before the throne of god and then through the hands of the priest and the deacon they bring it back to the people and you know and that's why we ultimately end up with what before we take we offer the gifts thine own of thine own we are giving you what you have given us and we give, we offer bread and wine, and God gives to us back, you know, his body and blood. So there is, I think, a flow. It's an absolute must, this flow of the people to God and God swinging the pendulum back to the people and offering the gifts of gift. And, and I think, um, you know, we're, we're um, even though in a, we think about ourselves as a singing church, um, our congregations haven't been singing and now there's more of um, more thought and practice being given to to asking the congregations to actually sing and when you think about the various hymns in our church mm -hmm. there are some that absolutely the congregation should sing simple simple songs like the two that we <laughs> say Tespers Vias, Holy God, Soson um, and and the Kiria Lesons and then also I think um, two other hymns that every congregation should know. One is the hymn of their church. That's their church's, um, what? Stamp. Stamp, <laughs> their, their song. Um, and the, the, the congregation should sing that. And then following communion, where the hymn is, we have seen the light, we have received the heavenly spirit. That's a hymn that everybody should sing. And then the, for the rest of the service, there are, either hymns that change, that the Archdeacon talked to us about, that every eight, to eight Sundays, every eight weeks, there's a new resurrectional apolitikion. Those can be left to the cantors and the choir. Um, and so that, that those can all be divided. But we're trying now to encourage the congregations to participate as well and to have congregational singing. And there's certainly room within the structure of our services for that to happen. And that's a good thing. If, if I can continue on that. Sure. Um, one of the things that we try to do, even in the Archdiocesan School of Byzantine mm -hmm. Music, which uh, there's been clearly efforts throughout the country and throughout the archdiocese. Yeah. People have made efforts to teach Byzantine music, to establish, you know, learning centers, schools, or finding a good, a good teacher and just getting people to come and learn. But one of the things we focused on is keeping it simple mm -hmm. because we want our students to be able to uh, go to a church and chant. and, and Clearly, for decades upon decades, our choirs have carried the brunt of divine liturgy. Um, but as we know, in Orthodoxy, I mean, especially Holy Week and Holy Lent, there's service after service after service. And a lot of our priests were feeling, you know, well, I would like to offer, but I don't have someone who can competently, you know, sing or whatever. And so definitely I would agree that uh, there is this element of, as we, uh, and simplify does not mean water down making it almost, you know, but simplifying it so that we can have a participation even more of the faithful who are in the pews. So we've talked you know. a lot about the choir, and I want to delve into the chanting 
because it's such a beautiful and almost exotic part of our worship. If your ear is not used to hearing it, it immediately strikes you. Mm. So doctor, let me ask you, there's always a, a tone, a deep tone that you hear oh, if the there's tone. the east tone. And, and is that something that you hear when two people or two or more well, are course. chanting? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but explain to us what's going on when we hear uh, the beautiful chanting. So this is called the Eason, and it's, uh, it's a note that is constantly being hummed by some members of the choir, uh, while the rest uh, sing the melody. So we have the melodists and the Isocrates, the ones who hold the Eason. This Eason is the most important, so to speak, note of the mode in which uh, a piece is sung. Um, Why is that the most important? And it's it, the most monotone. Right, but it's, but it's the one that the, the piece will eventually end on. Okay. And give us an example of what it sounds like. Just... Me the same note mm -hmm. at the end. Mm -hmm. So this practice is attested to uh, as far back as the 14th century, but in all likelihood it's ancient, and that can be uh, surmised from the design of certain instruments that produce a drone while being played. And uh, uh, John Tavener, uh, a very popular contemporary English composer in the classical Western tradition who uh, several years ago uh, converted to Orthodox Christianity, calls this the eternity note <laughs> because it represents the um, presence of God in the music. It's constant and unchanging. Of course, this is an a posteriori theological justification of this very old practice, but I think it's beautiful and it can be taken even further. Uh, the melody is constantly moving, just like the soul of the Christian is moving towards or away from God but eventually it finds rest when it is united with God, when the melody becomes one with the Eason. Wow. Good. <laughs> That's <Right>. really... <laughs> well, we thank you so much for enlightening us on this topic. Thank you to all our distinguished guests. We appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you. And please thank remember you. to log on to our YouTube channel. It's youtube.com slash Greek Orthodox Church. If you'd like to see more programs in this series called Discovering Orthodox Christianity, we invite you to do so. I'm Stacey Spanos. Thank you for watching.